Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of The Doctor Will See You Now. Um, I'm a great believer in the way that books uh, come across your path, and it would appear um, that we're carrying on with a theme of those places and spaces that seemed abandoned and forgotten, and oh, the mischief that happens in such places. So for our session, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Tariq Ashkanani. Tariq, so good to see you here. How's everything going? Very good, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's, been, it's very exciting to be here. It is a total pleasure. Um, you are based, are you not, in Edinburgh? That's right, I'm indeed. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it's a city that we are extremely fond of, uh, Newcastle Noir, uh, and it's almost like we could just reach over the border um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and have that great conversation. Um, and hopefully one day we'll actually be able to do this face to face. But for now, we'll be satisfied with the fact that we are online and it's great that we can, well, let me hold up a copy. So our discussion for the session is going to be your debut thriller, crime novel, Welcome to Cooper, um, published by Thomas and Mercer, uh, and it's out already, um, so paperback, it's out in ebook, and for those of you who like to close your eyes and listen, it's out in audiobook, and honestly, the audiobook version, it really uh, transports you. Um, so highly recommended if you like your stories gritty uh, with characters that seem beyond redemption, all of them. Anyway, <laughs> more on that later in the discussion. I'd love to know, as you're a debut author or, you know, in, in, in the crime and thriller genre, mm -hmm. why? What led you to putting together this story? Well, I mean, I think I think crime. I've always been drawn to crime stories. I think I've always loved reading them, writing, um, watching on TV. You know, I've always loved that kind of dark world of horrible stuff. And I don't know what that says about me, but that's the kind of thing I've always been drawn towards. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I remember, and back it was probably about twenty thirteen or so. I joined a. I'd always loved to write, even as a kid. I always loved writing stories. I had. I had what was pro probably the saddest scout badge, which was a writing badge. Everyone else was, was doing their first aid and camping, and I was just handing in short stories and notebooks. We like that badge. <laughs> yes. And uh, and so I've always loved to write and stuff. And then it, but I never really, and I always kind of wanted to be published and I wanted to write. I was always struggling with deadlines. I, I never finished anything. I kind of drifted away before I finished a story because something was popping my head. And then I joined a writer's group in 2013 and it was uh it was great because it was a week by week thing and you got a prompt and then you had a week to write a short story and then you just shared it with the group and everyone read everyone else's stuff and chatted about it and it was a really safe environment to yeah, yeah. To, to write stuff and to you know some stuff was crap some stuff was was quite good and etc and um the one week the prompt was a cop story and um and so i wrote the first i, I wrote a short story about this cop who goes this small town and finds this dead girl with her eyes scooped out and um I think I'd, I actually think I just watched seven recently and that was kind of in my head I think that yeah. whole like sadistic serial killer and a oppressive town and it's quite noiry and it's raining all the time and stuff and it's just the weather's a big part of it and so I that, kind of, that was in the back of my head and so I ended up writing the short story and then when I finished it a lot of the consensus that was getting back was that it was it felt like it was more the start of something as opposed to a complete story so that mm. ended up being the first chapter of welcome to cooper and uh, so that's where, where the idea came from and and it's i mean it's, in a lot of ways it's changed massively but in a lot of ways the kernel of the idea is still the same it's still the cop with a partner he doesn't know he can, he can trust with a dead girl with their eyes scooped out in this new town and that whole core has, hasn't changed at all so that was the kind of stepping off point I suppose for, for the story. So when you first penned this idea this yeah this kernel of an idea did you set it in Scotland or, or was it already set elsewhere? No I think when I wrote it I, I hadn't put any any location in it it was just an unnamed town and one of the things I kept getting back from people was you should they wanted to know where it was set and I would mm -hmm. I'd been and at first I kind of resisted that I don't know why but it, it, eventually I was like no I think obviously 
I have to put it down or I have to put a setting down for it. I can't just make it this no name city. So I started to think about where I wanted to set it. And I could probably turn to the stuff that I enjoy reading and writing and mm-hmm. watching. And a lot of it is American stuff. And so I, the stuff that I love is like True Detective, well, um, Mayor of Easttown, yeah. you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. That's my kind of bag. And even things like Luther and Line of Duty, those stuff are, it's quite Americanized. It's not really the, the British stuff, which I always think of as things like Silent Witness. And it's more kind of, Maybe procedural, or more procedural, mm. but more kind of about the hierarchy and more like about the 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 way that the police work. And whereas I kind of wanted to make it a bit more loose, and and that, for some reason, whenever I think of American crime, it's always less about how the police operate and more just about the crazy killers or the setting or the or the way the cops bit of break the rules. And that it's not something you tend to get in British crime drama. I don't really know why, unless it's British crime drama that feels very American. So I think I was drawn to that. And that's just, why, that's what... I, sorry to interrupt you, no, no, but, I'm, but the point that you've just raised, I think that is fascinating. Is it that in our, you know, British crime dramas, rather than crime fiction, but in our crime dramas, do we need to see the authorities, even if they are puzzled by what's going on, even, you know, they've got a crime, a mystery or whatever to, to, to solve, but it's they are very much the centre and very much in control. Yeah, it's true. It's funny, and I don't know why. But mm. whenever I think about stuff like even things like Broadchurch or you know the the kind of classic, really famous British crime dramas, it, it's all it, it, this is a real difference between something like that and something like Mary Beastel, where it is it's 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 much more. I don't know why, because even even on the surface, they're very similar. They're about communities. They're about yeah. a detective. Yeah. You've got red herrings. You've got families. You've got you know there's there's something about it which is different. I don't I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just like a kind of if it's just a British way of telling a story, or if it's just mm-hmm. the, the the setting or something. But there is definitely a difference. And I, for some reason, I'm always drawn towards the more American style of storytelling. And that and, and although, as I say, you look at stuff like Luther or Line of Duty. I mean, that, I don't know if it's a pacing, maybe. They're a lot more fast-paced than British stuff. I don't know if there's a more sedate pacing that we really seem to like here um, compared to American stuff, perhaps. But but that, that was what drew me to to, to, to set it in the, in the States in the end. And um, and I knew I wanted to set it away from, like, a, a major town, a major city. Yeah. And avoid somewhere like, you know, New York or San Francisco, or LA, or a place where we've seen so many yeah. big horror stories, big crime stories written already. And I kind of wanted to... And also, it's a place that I didn't really know. I was like, do I know it well enough to set a story there? I don't live there. You know, it's it's going to be very obvious that someone who's been there on holiday a couple of times and thinks he knows what the city's like and doesn't yeah. at all. Um, so I thought, well, actually, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I just <laughs> use this as an opportunity to set it somewhere that I've not really read much fiction set, which was the Midwest, and I'll make it in the middle of nowhere and I'll make up the town from scratch and just have more freedom to kind of just, you know, run with it almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, so you set this story in the end when it finally finds a home. <laughs> it, it, it ends up uh, in the state of Nebraska, uh, in a town called Cooper. Have you visited Nebraska? Do you know no, Nebraska? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. And and in fact, the one of the the earlier drafts that had I had rolling hills and big forests and stuff. And it went to the editor, and he said no. And they, they brought an American editor, in, which was oh. thankfully just really helpful. Mm-hmm. And he took one look at it and said. Nebraska is cornfields and flat, and all of this has to get changed because it's nothing like Nebraska. So I was really clueless about it, and so it was, it was interesting how how little I actually realised about it when I started writing it. And um, and yet and yet for how important the setting is, um, yeah, it, it was it was late on when it finally kind of clicked properly into place almost. Mm-hmm. I would be really intri- intrigued to see, you know, when when you know when the inhabitants of Nebraska, you know, when 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 they you know get to read the novel and give that feedback, how they feel about, you know, I whilst I know it's because it's a fictional place, is it not? Yeah, you, it is. They, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It would really need to be because I think <laughs> I think say this is what's going on in your town. I, just, <laughs> I don't think you'd get uh, a lot of fan mail no, <laughs> from so. that. But but as, as ever curious as I am. Um, because I wanted to, you know, to, to talk to you and be able to say this isn't a real place, is it? So I always like to have a little Google beforehand. 
And I was intrigued to find that there is, however, a power station, uh, a nuclear power station in Nebraska that's called Cooper, <laughs> Cooper Nuclear Power Station. And, and then it made me think of, you know, all that is bubbling away in in this, this place that you've created, that, you know, the reaction that is going on and whether, you know, the, the fallout, the leakage that's there. <laughs> Yeah. I will I will I will take credit for that, but I I had no idea there was even a power station called that. It's funny because I think of a you have a town and you kind of want to think of a name for it. And I spent ages just going through names, looking at lists of towns named in the world, mm-hmm. trying to find something. And yeah, it, it, I'm trying to because it's such an important part. Because for me, the town is almost a character in itself in the book, and it, you need it, it needs to be as strong as yeah. the character, you know, it needs to have that real feeling of place and memorable and it needs to feel real almost so yeah the, the the name of it and and I spent ages looking at photographs of small towns in America and mm-hmm. you know maps and where they were set population sizes and that was another thing I really struggled with was the size of the town and mm-hmm. how big is it you know how many churches does it have how many detectives work there and that kind of thing and and again that was I mean I really worked with with the editors on was nailing down the size of this place and making it consistent and that was something which was it's it's the kind of double edged sword of if you have you set it in a real place that works done for it's you. Done it's for great. you. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Whereas when you when you make it up from scratch, yeah, you've got the freedom to do what you want, but then you have to do everything yourself, and, and so it's, it's tricky. Did you enjoy that part of of the creation? No, that having that American editor and working was you know was it well you know what you presumably had to make changes or consider things. Was it a good process? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, very much. Like for me the writing that I really enjoy is the editing like that I, you know I find the first draft is awful I really struggle with that it's it, I'm writing I've got all those doubts in your head that this is crap and no one's going to read it and it's horrible and you finish it and you think this is just a pile of garbage and then you go back to it in a few weeks and you start to think okay I can tweak this and you and slowly over edit it starts to get closer to that mm-hmm. idea that was in your head to begin with and that you're getting closer to what that image was that you've always been trying to aim for and, and so having people help you with that, it's quite humbling to have all these people come in and say, right, let's work as a team to try and get your, your book as good as it can be. And it's a really nice feeling. And, and so I, I, was, I was just so incredibly grateful to have people who were genuinely there just to help me make it as, as good as it could be. And it, it, it was the work they put in and the improvements were just incredible from it. But I think what that, what that says to me again is that idea of when people see a story, that needs to be told and yet it might need you know a little bit of tweak a bit of change, but there is a story there that yeah. has to be put out there and that you know and without a doubt but then I was being a little bit wicked and thinking about you know the, the, the Scottish version welcome to Cooper yeah. and and yeah. and you know if, if you did a, a Scottish alternative <laughs> what could that be like but but we'll say that for another time <laughs> let's let's stick uh, in Nebraska so you're Main character, Detective Thomas Levine, um, he is not an original, uh, shall we say, uh, son of Cooper, is he not? No, he's not. No, he's um, he's from the big city. He's from, he's from uh, Washington, D.C., and he is kind of transferred to Cooper as a, he sees it as a punishment of sorts from mistakes he's done in his, in his job uh, and in his life, and he, and it's, and again, I kind of wanted it to be almost like a kind of purgatory place for him, like a kind yeah. of, you know, is, is, is he being punished? Is he trying to atone for something he's done in his, in his life, etc.? cetera? And, uh, and so he's got very much a uh, fish out of water. He's new to this place and he's, and, and part of it was that he's the kind of audience's way into this town. You know, he's learning what Cooper, as the reader learns about Cooper and he's partnering with a detective who he doesn't really trust and he's a really grisly murder and he's, Kind of getting implicated in stuff, and he's. I, I wanted that feeling of the whole way through the book. It's Thomas trying to get out from under all this pile of stuff that's just coming down his head, and he's trying to get to the truth and stay one step ahead of the cops that are after him and everything. And that kind of that kind of pacey chase almost the whole way through the book. Mm, mm, yeah, definitely. And and the thing that struck me as well about him. Um, it's that that notion. It's it's not unusual to have um, a detective, a police officer, you know, with baggage, and and you know, and and the damage that has happened beforehand. Yeah. 
But I wonder if at any point in this book, there's a sense that yes, he's here, he's been sent here and he views this as a punishment. But, but I wonder, is there ever a point where he, he has a renewed sense of purpose yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you're totally right that there's, you know, a cop with a drinking problem and some skeletons in his closet is a it's a cliche of us, isn't it? It's been done so many times before and it's a kind of a safe character that everyone is very familiar with. And I think you're right, that whole because that was something that was very, you know, I was I went over in my mind quite a lot. You're sending a character like that who's done bad stuff and it gets sent to this place as a kind of punishment, or at least he views it as as, as a punishment. Mm. What's the What's the outcome of that? Is it a redemption story? Is it a story of him atoning for past sins or saving someone's life to make up for the stuff that he's done, etc.? And it's it's tricky. And I think traditionally you totally would get that. You would have that character who's who comes at the other end and you think, oh, he's ultimately a good person because he's done some good and he's atoned mm-hmm. for his sins. And and as a and I think ultimately originally I when I was writing it, that was going to be the case. He was going to he was going to somehow save the day and you know atone for what he'd done. And then as I got closer to the ending, I kind of realized actually, I don't know if I I don't know how much of that how of that kind of trope I want to stick with. And I don't know if maybe is it more interesting if he's not if he fails, but if it's not quite as clean cut uh, an, an ending as people would normally expect. Because I think it's you want to subvert people's expectations and you want to have a twist, and it's and it's so hard nowadays because everyone's read so much crime and everyone's read. Mm-hmm every twist about imagine what I'm trying to do it in a way that people don't expect and yet make it feel like it's still been organically set up throughout the book and it's not coming out of left field it's really tricky and and yeah so I did I did go back and forth about whether or not how much of a turnaround I wanted to give Thomas or whether I wanted to make him actually maybe just not that likable a character and that's how much redemption does he need to get and that was a that was a balance I really I, I struggled with that quite a bit I went back and forth on that yeah mm-hmm. I think I think the again you know we mustn't say too much because no absolutely know, so that the, the story is there for people to enjoy but I think the choices you made for me there's two aspects to this I think you I think you were extremely brave to not go down the, the route <laughs> that people would expect I yeah. think that is really good but then I also wanted to ask you about the style of writing um, that that you adopt here, um, and whether that was already there at the beginning, you know, that idea of you know the two voices or the mm-hmm. you know that the, the, those different those narrative strands that are there, yeah, yeah. were they already there or did did they come as did, did that happen as part of the editing process? So when I first started off writing it, it was a really um, you know by the numbers crime novel and it was okay. very, more, much more straightforward much more just uh, similar to you know this guy gets sent to small town and, and gets caught up in it and he's trying to get up under all this crap and solve it and 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 it was much more straightforward and it was only and I was kind of maybe three four drafts into it and I thought I was just it wasn't working for me it was I was reading it back and I was like I'm actually a little bit bored it wasn't it wasn't yeah. exciting me enough and I was like I need to do I need to do something to to give it a bit of oomph and um, and I was watching True Detective and I knew I was like, I love that. I just love that vibe that they had, this kind of like over overwhelming feeling of like depression. You know, it's building to something. It's not going to end well. You know, these two cops who are, you know, so much of it was just the two of them driving around in cars, but they were, they, uh, the character work of that was just amazing. And I was like, that's, I just loved that feeling that I had when I was watching it. And I was like, I'd love to recreate that feeling in a reader when they're reading a book. And then I read the guy who did it, Nick Pizzolato. I read his book, um, Galveston. Mm-hmm. And and I, and almost in the first chapter, I was like, oh, "This is this is it." He he kind of had this really um, grim voice. It was it was in the character's head, but it was like it wasn't. It was talking to you almost a little bit. It was like a it wasn't, and it wasn't pulling any punches. And I was like, "That's exactly that's what I want. That's my goal." Mm-hmm. And and I think it's funny when you you know when I was that was it's my first book, and you're trying to find your voice, and so much of it is you're almost emulating the books and the authors that you love and you enjoy and and so I probably did about two three drafts I was like that I, that's kind of when a style I want to go in so I was trying to emulate that and it took a while to move away from just you're not trying to copy it you're trying to take it and you're trying to put your own voice mm-hmm. in it and you're trying to create something new from it all um, and it took a few drafts but then I felt but I felt I was well in the path once I once I knew the voice and the style that I wanted 
And at that point, almost at the same time, kind of had the idea of well, what if he is telling someone a story? And so I started making it, or oh, maybe he's being interrogated by cops, and so he's telling the reader the story. And then, I, and then, and that one thing led to another, and I thought, well, I can maybe take that a step further and make it a bit another, a bit another twist on that, and then I could try and build it to some kind of big ending. And so it, it was a very organic process that you know, draft by draft, almost it it, it became more and more different and, and more and more like the final product and less like a kind of clean cut standard crime story. Mm-hmm. But I think, I think, and I'm glad you did. I'm really glad you did because I think it's great. You know, as, as you, you know, you, you quite rightly say, you know, that there are so many and, I'm, you know, and it's wonderful that there are, but there are so many crime stories. Um, and very often, you know, those of us that, 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 that have, you know, it's our favourite genre, we like, the coziness of familiarity totally that we know where you know um and yet it's just it's amazing when someone comes along and says i'm just gonna shake that a little bit you know hey wake up come on come on we we can we this can be done in a different way um or try this on for size because i was talking to somebody the other day and how it's a little bit like you know your favorite slippers Mm-hmm. you know it's been a busy day and you just want to put the I just want to read a good formulaic absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah but every now and again it's like this is a special evening out <laughs> I'm going to put some different shoes on you know and yeah you know it might pinch a little bit um you know because I don't do this often yeah but oh boy am I glad because I went out and people said oh look at those they're amazing <laughs> shoes and I think it's the same with this text you know it's like Oh, what have you done? <laughs> wow, you know. And so I say, I think it's really brave. But you know, I really advise readers give this a go. You know, just just have that open mind and go with it because it's the ride that you take us on. I think it's it's very exciting. Oh, thank you. It, that's, that's really kind of you to say. And I think you're right that it's not something everybody will enjoy. And it's definitely from the reviews I've seen so far on Amazon and stuff. It's quite marmite, I think. And you know, loads of people love it and are giving it four or five stars, but then there's also people who are giving it one or two stars and just they just they just hate it. And I think it's because, as you say, it's 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 mm-hmm. it's because there is definitely um a kind of cozy comfort crime, and that's which is great, and that's most of the crime. I read is like that, and it's still they can do not twists, etc. But um yeah, it's not maybe not quite what people maybe normally expect with a crime novel, which I quite like that, and and I don't mind people not liking it, and that I kind of I mm-hmm. I don't mind. As long as I get a reaction of whether it's love right. or hate it, that's that's what I kind of look for. Yeah, exactly. To to find that that you know that it has provoked a yeah, response. Exactly. Yeah, uh, totally. yeah, and it's not just a meh. Well, yeah, it's okay. But I either one thing, you know, and 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 that that is good. Um, the idea though, um, of a character and the redemption or not of a character um, and we'll just come out of the text for a minute mm-hmm. um, because I know you know writing gives a lot of freedom um, but do you think you know that redemption you know is is possible that you know that in real life it's not a question of it is what it is and sadly there's no hope no, I think I think redemption is always possible. I think I think it, um, you know, no matter what you've done or has happened in your life, etc. I think there's always opportunities for you to improve on that and to and to change change or make the choice to be different or to be better, etc. I think that is absolutely possible, and I think um, it, it's often it's not easy to do and it's difficult to do, and um, but it always I think it comes down to what. Is important to you as a person whether you want that see that change or not and and whether you want that change to be recognized by people or you just want to see it in yourself and i think mm-hmm. it is it's definitely possible and i think i know maybe i'm that doesn't quite come across in my book but i think i think yeah i think it is definitely possible for sure yeah. mm-hmm. thank you um characters and the cast of characters that we have here and again i think you know um decisions that you've made in the creation of these characters it's hard it's hard to get close to these damaged unsympathetic characters 
Were you worried at all that, you know, again, many readers, you know, they want somebody that they can root for and despite all their flaws, you know, think, yeah, but they're a good egg, really. Or, yeah, yeah. but look, they do this. Um, and and do you think it's necessary for us to find characters like that in order for us to really enjoy a story? No, I think it's a great question. I think, I mean, when I gotta say, when I first started writing the book, Thomas was a much more of a kind of classic anti-hero character of someone who had been done bad stuff and he was trying to make it better. And so even, uh, and, and so that my aim at that point was to have the reader say, well, He's not the nicest guy, but he's trying to do better and you root for him and he's he's trying to do right. He's struggling to try to, try to do the right thing. And then when I, I swung back hard the other direction and way too far, I think, and I made him I made him quite unlikable. I, made him, I mean, he's not the most likable character at all in the final draft, in the final book, but in the in the earlier drafts, he was even more unlikable. And, and I've been reading a lot of a lot of noir and a lot of James Elroy. You know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. It was early confidential and stuff. And you've got these characters who are just who really are horrible characters. You know, they beat people up, they beat women up, they rob people, they shoot people, they, and yet Elroy always managed to make you root for them in a way that even if you're like, I, I don't like you, but in this scene, I need, you need someone like that person in this horrible world that's created to be, to, to fight in your corner. And it's the same with stuff like you watch The Shield and you've got Vic Mackey, who's this horrible cop, but there's moments when you're like that, and in this moment, I want him to fight my fight for me. Yeah. And so I was trying to kind of work out how far can you take a character before people don't root for him. And then I was like, well, do you people do you need people to root for him? Like, you know, how important is it that you do root for a character? And can you walk, can you watch or read a, a story where you don't like anyone in it? And and it's a really interesting point. And I ended up dialing it back in the final book a little bit. Um, you know, he does, he did, he, I, I cut some stuff out that he did that I was maybe taking it too far. And mm-hmm. I was like, I'm maybe going to mm-hmm. lose people toward, especially towards the final third. I thought maybe this is too much. And, and some of the feedback I was getting from, my, from the beta readers yeah. and um, the editor was like, maybe, you know, you, it's a tightrope. You want, you still want folk to be invested in the story and want to see where this character ends mm-hmm. up. And if they mm-hmm. really hate him, then maybe they lose interest in that. And so it is tricky. And, you know, we've been watching Succession at the moment and, it was just a, it was just a show full of characters and they're all horrible, nasty people. And yet you're compelled to follow their story. And so I think you can 100% write a story or a script where you've got characters that are pretty nasty and, you know, don't do very good um, and still enjoy it and still want to see where their story arc leads. And I don't know if the key is to give them just enough goodness or to give them the hope that they might be good is that what or is it or is it just a case of accepting these this person is never going to be good no one I'm in the show or book is going to be good and that's okay and it, it's it's a really tricky it's a lot harder to do that and to not turn folk off I think for sure yeah 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 very much so the I don't know it's almost like the grading of exactly, unpleasantness exactly. Yeah, unsympatheticness totally. um, yeah. b- because if we go along the lines of you know good versus evil then uh, it, you know it's easier to to place characters on, on totally. you know totally. on either side I mean, of that I mean you look at stuff like American Psycho I mean that is a guy who is a horrible person and yet you know but people love that book and it's how how would you how does Brett S. Nealis write this book with this horrible serial killer character and yet people want to read it and it's it's a real skill and I think and he's taken that right to the extreme and still managed it and that's amazing that's I don't know how he did that and that's some so it is possible I think yeah yeah and and you know what what draws us in to want more um before the end of our conversation I'm going to ask you you know having seen what we've seen then you know, I know you're working on 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 a follow up, mm-hmm. and and where where might that take us? But let's just stick in in with with Welcome to Cooper, um, for a minute. And and the book spoke to me as well about the idea of choices. You know that we, to a certain extent, we we are, you know, those who own our own fate. Mm-hmm. And and so, I wonder, do you, do you do you hold with that in real life? I think yeah, I think you do. I think the choices you make, um, 
you know, you, ha you do have to own them, I think. And no matter where they lead you, I think the only way to really, you know, we talked earlier about redemption and stuff. And I think if you're going to be honest and if you get to a point where you think, I don't like where I've ended up and I want to change that, I think the only way to, to change that is to own up and accept where, where you've reached and what you've done to, to reach that point. So you do, I think the choices you make, you do have to own them. And I think only by owning them can you then make fresh, correct choices to course correct whatever, in whichever manner you want to do. But I think, yeah, you do have to own them. And I think in fiction, I think you, you only really, I think if you, the reader knows if, you're, if they've been cheated, if the yeah. characters ended up somewhere because of plot or because it doesn't feel accurate, you know, I think it, it's, that was another thing which happened when I was getting towards the end, the ending that I had in mind didn't fit the character of Thomas anymore. He'd become this character who was quite damaged and dark and not the nicest person. And actually I was like, I don't think he can have this ending that I had in mind the first time. Mm -hmm. I was like, it, it would feel cheated. I think you, you, I had to just, it almost kind of, the ending was like this depressing end point, which was, he was barreling towards and I thought, I can't take him off this path. He has to end up here. And it, and, and, and once that was in my head, I knew where he was going to end up. Um, it was a lot easier to get him there. And it just, because it flowed naturally, it felt like a natural place to take him to. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, can we just take a little side step a minute? Because in, in, in reading about you before we, we met today, I read that you, and, and I'd love um, to, to, have, to get my hands on, on some of this merchandise. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> so you have a Kickstarter company called Right Gear. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So it was me and two two friends. We um, we were chatting one day about how much we love notebooks, and as writers, we mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I've got a pile of notebooks that I scribble notes in, and um, we and how when you come down to then use these ideas and, and to write a story from them, it's that case of which notebook did I put it in? Where's the bloody note that I put? And you're flicking through stuff, and and we thought it'd be great to to have a notebook where you it was a kind of structured notebook for writers, and so you had your um, sections on plot, setting, characters, and it was all with lots of prompts and lots of stuff to fill in and grids to sketch out settings and scenes and um, and then the end to track your submissions to editors and agents and things like that. So we and that's what that's where the idea came from. And so um, it was, it's me and another writer friend and then a, um, a friend who's really good at all the graphics and he's done an amazing job. And so the three of us we put together this kind of notebook and we went to Kickstarter and um, and yeah, it was a really good success. People there seemed to be a real market for it, which is fantastic. And so we've completely sold out the first run and we're waiting on second print coming out now. And uh, and yeah, so it, it's been so much fun. Even, we always kind of thought, even if it's, just, if it's just a one time thing, it's just a really fun thing to do. And a, a really fun thing, thing to, to do. To yeah. Engage huh? with the right. And then, then, you know, feedback we got on what people wanted to change in the second print run was great because then we were chatting with people who bought it and what do people really want from a notebook? And it's, you know, it's been a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. And then from, from that, we also spun out a podcast. Overall, we were chatting to a number of age and a number of authors about their writing writing process and how they got started. And because I think what we wanted to do was kind of create this notebook and podcast that was all about like how to get people into writing and to talk about, you know, how did the other authors find to get the big break? You know, mm -hmm. what was the process and finding yeah. an agent and getting a published deal and all that kind of thing. And and to show people how it, the million different ways that people get into writing and and how there's no set path. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then a little bit to help them with their ideas and stuff. And it's been, so hopefully it's been a really good thing that folk have maybe found useful to just to help them write. Because I think that for me, the, any help I can get to, to yeah. get words on the pages is, is always great. Yeah, quite. It might just take one phrase from someone or one step. To, exactly. Yeah. yeah. To just un, unleash all of that. So is the, is the podcast, is that still is that still up and running? Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've, we've been recording, I think we're on season 10 we're on episode 80 odd at the moment so we've, yeah. we've chatted to some amazing people and what's been really interesting is that every author we've chatted to has been whether they're graphic novel script book etc everyone struggles with the same stuff everyone always struggles with that feeling of doubt with that feeling of writer's block with you know imposter syndrome all that kind of stuff it's, it's mm -hmm. totally natural and it almost you feel I think a bit relieved and you think oh it's not just me who struggles with Right in the first draft, you know, it's a normal thing. Uh, it's just going to push through, and I think normalizing the kind of fears that people have about writing and how, and sharing your work with people, because it's a really solitary thing. Writing, you're by yourself, and then suddenly yes. you are out in the world and you're sharing with people, and it's quite 
for a lot of people, it's quite scary, and uh, and it's okay. To, it's, it, knowing that it's okay to feel like that, I think is is really important. D definitely, definitely. And and so the podcast's called Page One. That's right. It is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Let's go back to the book. Um, and I'd like you, if you can, um, to tell me in the process of creation, which is the part that you are proudest of? And which is the part that caused you the most heartache hassle? Ooh, okay, so the part that I'm most and they might of... be the same thing. Yeah. In the end, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think. Well, the part that caused me the most hassle, I think, for sure, is is the was the earlier was the first like five or six drafts and trying to get a hold on what the story was and trying to find trying to get a grip on because I mean. But I, I, I probably did about 13, 14 drafts of this thing in total. And the first half of them where there was tons of characters and I had um, I had serial killers and cops and internal affairs agents and everyone running around the small town. And I couldn't, I, every time I wrote it, I would read it back and I was like, it's just not working. I really, for, for a couple of years, I struggled with, with, it, with this. And it, 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 was, it was only when I realized I need to cut some characters out of this it's just too bloated and so I, I and I was that was difficult because you, you have a character that you quite like and it's got some really good lines and some good scenes and you think no I need to I just need he's just superfluous mm -hmm. and so you cut him out and took his I can actually I mean maybe ended up amalgamating him into another character mm -hmm. and so they kind of shared the same role in the story um, and there was that moment of I felt kind of bad, but then you've still got that stuff in a drawer somewhere you can pull up another story. Yeah. You know, it's no, you're not throwing it into the bin forever. Um, so that was that 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 was hard, but then it was it was also really nice when when suddenly you're like, ah, it clicks. Suddenly it was like it's got room, this character's got room to breathe, they're serving more of a point to the story, they're they're pulling double duty. So that because that's one of the things I remember reading about was to make sure that your chapters and your characters are always you're always pushing the plot forward or trying mm -hmm. for it's, it's, it's never just wasted text and there's always a point to it and um and, and so there was there was moments as i started to trim trim it down and get closer to the final product because these moments we think oh it's starting to that change which i i, I didn't want to do i know was now the right thing to do because it's, right thing, yeah. it's working it's clicking properly and that's an amazing feeling when you when you look over draft and you think, oh, it's just, it flows really well. It's, it's, it, it, it's just working the way that it was and it was really clunky before. And that's a really nice feeling. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I think to be able to get to that point of, this is okay. Yeah. This feels okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. And, it, it, and for me, it does it because those first few drafts, like I say, that vomit first draft, it's just horrible. And you're writing, and, and you're, as you're writing it, you're like, this is dreadful. This is horrible stuff. <laughs> And it's, it's only, it is, it's like three, four drafts down the line, but it's starting to edge towards that kind of vague story you had in your head at the start. And you think it's, it's actually, it's not crap. It's actually, it could be good. There's something here, yeah. you know, it's starting it's, to yeah. work. And yeah. that, that, that's that kind of buzz you think I could write for hours, just building on it. You don't want to stop when you're getting that lovely flow. It's, it's really fun. Definitely, definitely. And I do love the fact that, you know, and here it is. You yeah, know, it is, you know, yeah, after all that work and, and yeah. all that consideration, here it is. But I know that when we come to talk about the book, of course, you know, that's it's that, yeah, that's done. So yeah. if, if it's all right, what I'd love for us to, to, to close our time together with is, you know, in, in the blurb, it says he is currently working on a follow up thriller. Yeah. Is this true? <laughs> It is indeed true. Yeah, I've actually today I just handed in the proof edit to the back to the editor today, so that's been it's pretty much locked in almost now. Book two. So and book two was was tough because I I was lucky enough to get a two book deal when I signed with mm -hmm. this one. So I always knew I had a second book that I needed to, to do, and I had a rough idea that I kind of told them, and they liked the idea, but they said, "Right, great, you know, write that." Um, and the second book was tough because you have you know unlimited time. I spent about ten years working on the first book, yeah. and now you've got about. You know, um, eight months yeah. over, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you think, Jesus, and, uh, and 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 again, it's only really possible because you've got a team of folk really helping you bounce ideas off, and people, your friends, and stuff. And and so I, I came to write book two, and I thought, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to make it a, a direct continuation? Is it going to be same characters, another story with them? Is it going to be a, a standalone? And and what I've ended up deciding on is is that Cooper itself, um, the town is is is. Is the kind of key and so the book two is actually set about 30 years earlier 
in, wow. in the town, yes. Phil Cooper, and the main character is Joe, who's the uh, he's a major character in, in the first book, but he's he's not the main character. So he's the he's he's the he's the partner of Thomas, and he's not he's I mean Thomas is bad, but Joe is worse in a lot of ways. He's yeah. a lot more more morally dubious and stuff. And I thought it'd be really fun, but then. I thought when I, was, when I was writing it, you never really get a lot of Joe's backstory. You don't really find out why he is aligned with mm-hmm. certain people the way he is, mm-hmm. etc. So I thought it'd be really fun to go back and and do a and do a, a a story that's like he's just starting out, so he's kind of fresh detective, very young, um, and gets involved in a um, in a in a case, and it kind of shows you how he maybe ends up being mm-hmm. where he is, and and also part of it was 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 me thinking about well, it's a small town how many serial killers or horrible murders can you have in a small town? You know, it gets a point where you think it's a bit silly. So, so I thought if I make it 30 years or earlier, that's enough time. You could have a pretty gruesome case that, that's, that's, that's not on right in the heels of a previous one. Yeah. Um, so it's set about 30 years early in the 90s and it's about a family that gets murdered in their beds, in their home, and Joe's fresh on the case and he, he starts to investigate it. And it, and, and in a similar way to Welcome to Cooper, it's a lot of it is about his um his own kind of inner inner demons that he brings to the case and um the the um the town itself I wanted to I wanted to pull back a little bit and it's not so much in Joe's head as this one. So so I, I kind of knew I wanted to do the exact same thing. So it's a third person yeah, story. Yeah. Pull back more, you get you get you get multiple characters' viewpoints, not just Joe's, mm-hmm. and you kind of get the politics of Cooper. There's a there's politicians, there's the mayor, there's reporters and stuff. So it's it's more of a kind of a bird's eye view almost of a case, mm-hmm. and, and so Cooper itself is more of a part to play, in, I suppose, in that sense. Wonderful. And it was really fun because you got to do it in a setting where there was no cell phones, you know, mobile phones. Yeah. Everyone's got pagers, you know, and in some ways you were restricted, but in some ways you were like actually. There's no Google. It's so much easier. You can you can get away with stuff a lot quicker. You know, you don't have to always think of well, how would you get away with this because there's a GPS in his phone or, or whatever. You know, you can get rid of all of that. No one's got cameras in their pockets all the time. So in some ways, it's quite freeing to think you can you can. It's a lot simpler, which is quite nice. And uh, and yeah, and I, and I knew I wanted to make it a bit of a wider scope. So it's been it was a lot of fun fleshing all that out and uh, and still trying to find a twist that's that we don't don't see coming. Um, which again is maybe the hardest part, I think, actually. I am I am absolutely thrilled by the decision that you've taken to go backwards because there are a lot of you know whilst this you know the the, the welcome to Cooper it, you know it's there and it's complete but anybody with any level of curiosity you know will be saying so who, why is X Y and Z the way they are exactly. Well, yeah. exactly Thomas comes into the story and he's he's kind of joining something that's already it's already in motion, there, yeah. it's already there and he's it's very much the end product by the time he arrives so I thought it'd be really fun to go and see how does this place end up the way it is and how does Joe end up the way he is and and so yeah and and it's almost in much the way that I suppose when Thomas came into the scene he's already had his downfall you know he's had before the story even starts and he's kind of been you know in his in his yeah. mind punished for it whereas I thought with Joe's story it's almost we're seeing this man's downfall or this his arc into how he becomes how he is and so that was much more fun to kind of have him as a yeah. fresh face nice character at the start yeah Be- <laughs> before the, the fall yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. so it was, it was a lot of fun yeah. wonderful Eric, thank you so much for our time together oh, it's always it was really exciting to get to know you know new authors and the texts that that, that they're bringing us um i just think you know this the, the, the I want to say the sparkle around this, but of course Cooper doesn't sparkle far <laughs> from it. No, but I think, but I think the writing, you know, I think there's there's a there's a, there's a fab sparkle there, um, and and I really look forward to to the prequel because it is in a way a prequel. Of, it is. Yeah. Of, I mean, it's, the it's, yeah, it's going to stand alone. So I wanted to make it the folk could read it in any order, but you'll definitely get more out of it if you yeah. read read them in the order that they they are released for sure brilliant so all the all the very best with Thank welcome very to much. cooper uh, and look forward to seeing you again soon awesome thanks for having me that was great a fun. pleasure goodbye bye-bye <laughs>